everybody, welcome to another video here on YouTube. For those of you guys that know me, welcome back. For those that might be new to this channel, my name is Dr. Elise Tercy. This channel is dedicated to all things holistic health and wellness related. We talk about immune system regulation, weight loss, hormone balance, body pain, alignment, emotions. There's so many things we talk about. So if you're new here, thanks for tuning in. I hope that you end up joining us and subscribe to this channel. So today I'm actually creating this little video for a number of reasons. One of which is because I want to share a little bit more details about an upcoming workshop that I'm hosting in April. So for those of you guys that know me, you know I do host lots of virtual events, lots of workshops just to create community around topics and really bring in like-minded people who want to learn about how they can show up for their health, how they could be proactive. With that being said, I am hosting a workshop on Saturday, April 3rd, and I'm going to link the year because I feel like when 2022 comes, people will be watching this wondering what happened to that workshop. So it is coming up this year, 2021, and the, the actual workshop is all about Epstein-Barr virus. And you guys know me, if you're in my practice, you know I'm a big proponent, a big advocate around awareness of this, around making sure we're testing for this. How do we support the body through immune system host response? That is the workshop, okay? So the workshop is all about Epstein-Barr virus. We are going to dive into all of the things connected to this virus, the etiology of it, the uh, way it kind of creates metabolic dysfunction, why we call it an ATP thief, why it's considered a metabolic stressor to, to the body, why it's also connected to autoimmune conditions. So if you are someone watching this video and you've never heard of EBV, please stay tuned till the end of this video. There might be some stuff in here that you learn that's helpful to your health. If you already know about EBV, please also stay tuned and also consider joining the event, the workshop, because I am going to share the details about this Epstein-Barr virus from a way that might not be as obvious to you as you once thought. And what that really is going to mean is that Epstein-Barr doesn't just stop there. We actually can talk about its, con its connectedness, if you will, to autoimmune thyroid dysfunction, to multiple sclerosis, Burkitt's lymphoma, all different types of um, autoimmune conditions. So if you think that you know about this, give yourself a little opportunity to really stay tuned for the whole video because there might be some stuff that you're like, wow, I didn't realize that I am maybe potentially dealing with a chronic infection that I didn't know was there. Okay, so that's my little intro, little tidbits about the workshop. This will be coming up, like I said, Saturday, April 3rd. If you're interested to join, I would hope that you do. I will link everything down below in the description bar. So please be um, sure to check that out for registration for the event. We are limiting it to 44 people for this event. Um, so if you're interested to come, please be sure to do that. Anyways, let's just dive right into all about EBV. What the heck is EBV? What the heck is it? You guys might have heard of mononucleosis. Mononucleosis is the name of the actual disease, if you will, that is known to us, but it's actually caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is a double-stranded DNA virus. It does belong in the herpes simplex 4 family. And it's a very, very common, common virus that most of us do see. What ends up happening is, traditionally speaking, when we're younger, typically age range about 18 to 25, that is when we are most available, if you will, for the virus to infect us. Oftentimes, it can look just like strep throat. We sometimes feel swollen glands in our neck. We might even get a little bit of a sore throat. We might end up having white patches on our throat not really think much of it. We might even go to the doctor and get a test. That test will come back as negative for strep throat. We move on with our day. We don't think anything of it, but there could be a Epstein-Barr virus infection that's happening without our knowledge. So a lot of people hear this and their ears perk up saying, I never had mono. I never had mono. You, you likely did. And the reason I'm saying that is because about 93% of the world has actually been infected with EBV herpes simplex 4. 
It's a very prevalent, very common virus. We often don't always have symptoms for it. If we do have symptoms, those symptoms will be associated with what I just talked about in terms of how it shows up, how it actually presents in the actual body. Now, this is a virus that affects the B lymphocytes, which the B lymphocytes are cells that are connected to our immune system. So initially, I'm going to talk about kind of the, the way we, we get this, the way it comes in the evolution of this, the life cycle of this, if you will. We oftentimes pick the virus up through saliva. A friend of ours has it. That's why it's known as the kissing disease, because it's very common to pass this through salivary secretions. We might sneeze on somebody, we might share a fork or a spoonful of something, and that person may or may not know that they have this virus, and now I have just contracted the virus. So I might not get symptoms, I might get symptoms, and what ends up happening is that because this affects the B lymphocytes, there is a direct connection to immune system regulation with this virus, as are all viruses, any critter, if you will. So bacteria, virus, fungus, we, we get exposed, they come into our body, and then our immune system says, wait a second, you don't belong here. And it tries to flag it as a memory of, oh, I remember that you are a foreign invader, you could potentially be a threat. If that happens, where we get infected, we may or may not know, problems may not arise until fast forward down the road, where people end up starting to say, I'm exhausted, all the time. I'm really, really tired. I don't understand why. And then we can go looking for some associated diseases that are connected to fatigue. And I will share with you guys, if you're watching this, that chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and certain autoimmune conditions, namely Hashimoto's thyroiditis, also Burkitt's lymphoma, these are all conditions, if you will, that are connected to Epstein-Barr virus. There is connection between the two. Now, not everybody that develops those types of conditions absolutely has problems with Epstein-Barr, but there is connection and correlation between I got infected and now I'm having problems with my energy. The nature of this virus is it's a mitochondrial affected virus where when I make energy, this virus it is going to steal what I make. And that's by default how viruses live. So they can only live in a host, meaning they can only live in an actual person that's gonna provide for them. Think of it almost as imagine you're a parent and your children are coming to you for money and money and money and money and money. Can I have money? Can I have money? Mom, dad, can I have money? Well, that's what a virus does. They come to the body and they say, can I have, can I have, can I have, can I have, can I have? And they just take what they want. Just like your, your family members sometimes say, I just borrowed your sweatshirt and I forgot to ask you. Viruses are innately thieves. They take from us. They can only live in a host, which means they can only live if they're given the right nourishment. So what happens is that we may or may not know that we're feeding this virus or that this is even a problem for people. Now, just because you've been exposed doesn't mean you're gonna have immune system dysfunction, which the virus does like to cause. It's not necessarily an automatic thing that, oh, because I have um, mono, I'm gonna develop infectious mononucleosis and then I'm gonna develop immune system dysregulation. That is not true. However, in certain people, for many reasons, genetics, um, different types of polymorphisms at the gene level, different types of predispositions to already having immune system dysregulation, people that are already dealing with chronic conditions that make them more affected by immune system problems, they may be more apt or pre-exposed or predisposed to having problems. So I just wanna make it very clear, just because you're exposed doesn't mean you're gonna have problems. Kind of like what's happening now with C19, where we sometimes have people that have symptoms we sometimes have people that don't have symptoms. We sometimes have people that are ending up with long-term symptoms. We sometimes have people that are like, I didn't feel anything, I don't have problems, and I've supposedly been exposed. So we don't always know who is going to get affected with the, the symptoms that are associated with this long-term, okay? So it's a little bit of a crapshoot to some degree. There are reasons why, but we're not really gonna dive into that in this video in terms of who is more of a candidate. Obviously, anybody that is eating a poor diet, missing certain vitamins and minerals, missing nutrients is already predisposed. Those are kind of uh, connected factors to why somebody might get this. 
So let's fast forward what happens. When we're infected with Epstein-Barr virus, the virus does go and travel into the B lymphocytes, our B cells, which are associated with our immune system. And they hijack the cell through a lot of different techniques, one of which is called molecular mimicry. They basically steal, hijack, and then they travel to the circulatory system. And now they're widespread throughout the body. And so what we can do is oftentimes look in blood work. And I will share with you guys a profile that I often order in practice to look to see if someone is dealing with chronic infection. There's four specific things we're looking for in a more conventional lab test. And I wanna just preface this for a moment this is not going to be run on a standard profile. So if you're watching this thinking, how come my doctors never told me I have this? Probably what's happening is your doctor never told you you have this because they're not looking for it often, unless you're going to maybe infectious disease doctors, unless you're being treated for things that are of unknown origin. For example, any type of stealth infection, if you're saying someone, if you're someone out there saying, I think I have Lyme disease, I have a lot of joint pain, I have a lot of bone pain, a lot of pain presentations or even chronic fatigue syndrome patients will be tested for this virus if they're working with someone who is aware and, um, really conscious that this exists because what happens is that when we are infected our b cells differentiate and it creates dysfunction in our b cells which means it creates immune system dysfunction in our body and because it's a virus it's always in us we don't get rid of viruses and i always share this with people the goal of this is not to get rid of your memory you will always make memory through immunoglobulin g that you've been exposed to the virus that's not the concern the concern is that are these cells creating dysfunction in other areas and organs of my body that's where we start to have problems and like i said the the tissues often involved are of course circulatory system because that's how the virus spreads. It, it enters into our circulatory system through vasculature. It also loves to seed the thyroid gland. You'll hear me say that term frequently, seeding the thyroid gland, which means it loves to go into the gland. And then what happens is this. So I've been expect I've been expected, I've been infected with Epstein Barr and now it's traveling through my B cells into my bloodstream and it has affinity for the thyroid gland. Think of it like this. Not all tissue goes to all or not all disease goes to different tissue. For example, what's the deal with the diabetes? Why does diabetes affect the pancreas and then maybe long term the kidneys? Why doesn't it affect the um gallbladder it does to some degree but why doesn't it affect the parathyroid hormones it does to some degree but not directly each tissue type is affected by different viruses that's just the nature of the life cycle of anything it's like why is so and so bored with you know 10 toes and 10 fingers because those are humans. That's how we kind of differentiate different features from them. They have eyeballs and they stand on two feet and you know, that's kind of the, the way it works, so to speak. Why does it go to the thyroid? That's just the organ that it likes to choose to go to. Through molecular mimicry, it does end up affecting the thyroid gland. And now your body starts to say, wait a second, I'm noticing that there is this immune system storm happening inside the thyroid gland. So our body almost then starts to mount even a, a further response in our gland. And so we attack our thyroid tissue. We're not really attacking our thyroid tissue. We're attacking the virus that lives in our thyroid tissue. That's how inherently it gets a little bit confusing or the body gets a little bit confused, if you will, is that the body is not purposely trying to attack your thyroid. It's purposely trying to attack the virus particles that now live in the thyroid gland. And so there is a little bit of cross connection there between how we develop organ dysfunction. Now, if we might suspect that we have this, let's talk a little bit about symptoms that are more chronic. So what you guys will hear me talk about is an acute infection and then a chronic reactivation or a dormant infection that's become active. An acute infection is an infection that happens very early on. It's an infection that happens when we're initially exposed and it does create that initial 
basically immune system response through what's called immunoglobulin M. So the heterophile immunoglobulin M blood test tells us a little bit that I've been newly exposed. This is recent that I'm seeing this versus an IgM hetero, heterophile profile that tells us about what is the viral load to different pieces of the particle, different pieces of the virus. Once I am now in a place of a chronic space. So now it's not like, oh, I've been dealing with this for two, three, four weeks. It's now, oh, I was exposed years ago, fast forward time, and now the virus is causing problems for me later in life. That can happen. The blood testing is something that we look at. We're looking for a VCA, a viral capsid antigen. We're looking for IgM, IgG, immunoglobulin cells that tell us how um, new is the infection versus how old, and then what is the antibody load? How many antibodies are we actually creating? So we can look in the blood work if we suspect someone is dealing with this. How would we suspect someone's dealing with this? They are going to be symptomatic, and the symptoms are not going to rear their ugly head as an obvious symptoms, although in late stages or in very chronic conditions, people do have a lot of dysfunction in their body. Okay, so the virus can create a lot of dysfunction, but it's going to start subtly where I'm tired all the time. It's the kind of tired that no matter how much sleep you get, you're not recovered. You're not recovered. You're also going to have body pain. You're going to have joint pain. You're going to have pain in your body that feels achy and deep. You might be even having lymphadenopathy where your lymph nodes are swollen. I'm pointing in the neck that doesn't have to be the only area where lymph nodes get swollen. That is a very common area, the deep and anterior cervical chain lymph nodes, also underneath the armpit, in the inguinal region, anywhere where there's lymphatic tissue, there is possible lymphadenopathy when we're in a chronic place or when the virus has reactivated. You might even be getting um, little bouts of fevers where you're spiking low-grade fevers consistently or you're spiking low-grade fevers randomly without any any kind of time frame where it's like, I don't know why I'm having a fever. You also could be having heart palpitations. Tachycardia is associated with Epstein-Barr, sometimes skin rashes, and of course, anxiety depressive disorders. Because remember, when we get infected, everything gets activated. This virus doesn't just pick and choose one area of the body to live in. It is a systemic virus because it's traveling through the B lymphocytes that move in and out of the circulatory system. And so we do end up finding widespread disease and dysfunction with this now, virus. Conditions or actual diseases that are associated with Epstein-Barr virus are encephalitis, myocarditis, you can definitely develop autoimmune diseases, hemolytic autoimmune blood disorders, um, Strogan's multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, all of those at the core of the crux of those conditions, there is an autoimmune condition. There's an underlying autoimmune or immune system dysregulation happening in all of those conditions. And Epstein-Barr virus is the culprit behind a lot of those, namely, um, through the way it, its life cycle, the way it lives. It creates dysfunction in the immune system. It can also be associated with cancers and certain lymphomas because it's a lymphocytic type of critter. It goes into our B lymphocytes. So anything associated with our lymphocytes can become affected by this virus. And so cancers that are more, uh, like I said, uh, lymphocytic cancers can develop with this chronic virus. Now you guys might be wondering, what do I do then if there's no cure because it's a virus and I do think I'm dealing with autoimmune conditions or I am dealing with symptoms, what are my options then? Options are to support your immune system so that we want to fight and build you up. There are some really nice antiviral agents through enzyme therapy. There are things that we use high dose protease that can puncture the actual viral capsid antigen or the capsid. So the viruses are enveloped. When you look at Epstein-Barr under a microscope, it has certain criteria and characteristics. It lives in a shell, if you will. And that shell is very difficult to um, get into, if you will. And we want to get into the shell because inside the shell is the goodies, if you will. That's where the DNA lives. And so a lot of these viruses are considered stealth. Epstein-Barr is in that same category because the way it hides, the way it evades the immune system. And if you're watching this video and you've been told, don't worry about your virus that we looked at in your bloodstream 
that's old, I really want to challenge you. Please do not settle for that as the answer. That's old. That is true. It's likely an old virus, but that doesn't mean it's not causing dysfunction. That doesn't mean it's not causing dysregulation. So if anybody dismisses this virus, they have no knowledge of this. They have no knowledge of the actual life cycle and the actual complications it causes. And I really wanna encourage you and invite you guys to, to, to really get a little bit more like, hmm, let me be a little bit more proactive with that because my body is mounting an immune response. My blood work is saying there's problems here. It's flagged in red and I'm feeling problems. We, we would wanna go down the rabbit hole and support you. Like I said, there's many ways. There's a specific diet for Epstein-Barr virus. There are herbs, antivirals, tinctures, and enzymes that will help eradicate the load and stop viral replication. EBNA2, EBNA2, Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen 2. What is the deal with that? It is a viral particle or a viral protein that is associated with lupus. So they're finding that when they're looking at the genome, they're looking at the actual sequencing of different genetics that we are coding for the Epstein-Barr virus in some of these metabolic conditions or in some of these autoimmune conditions like lupus. And so they're finding now more and more when they're looking at the virology, when they're looking at the actual tissue under histology microscopy, they're saying, oh my goodness, we're finding that there's viral particles from Epstein-Barr in 50 different segments of this gene. So they're looking at the gene saying, okay, here is the gene. They've identified 50 genetic associations with lupus and Epstein-Barr, in particular EBNA2. So there is so many things that are coming out around this virus that are connecting it to all of these different autoimmune conditions. And so really from an autoimmune perspective in terms of treatment, what do you do for autoimmune conditions? What do you do for Strogan's? What do you do for lupus? What do you do if you have MS? A lot of it's more symptoms management. It's not necessarily doing it's not fixing the autoimmune condition. It's suppressing your immune system to some degree, or it's changing your immune system in the host, but it's really based and connected to more symptom modification, more so than quieting down the viral load and changing the, the genes. We can change our genetics through nutrition. We can change our genetics through thoughts and the things we think about. We're very powerful people. We can change our genetics through enzyme therapy. Obviously, that's a chemical change. Those are the, the reasons we use supplements and tinctures and antivirals, things like monolaurin, L-lysine, noni berry, bilberry extract, white willow, megadose protease. All of the organs that are in the reticular endothelial system do pretty well with those types of um, interventions. But the point of this is, and I know I'm rambling, is that they're finding so many genetic associations to Epstein-Barr living in the genetics and living around these other autoimmune conditions. Pretty wild, right? That being said, guys, I just want to challenge you that if you think something is not right with your health, it's probably because it's not. We are very innately connected to knowing when something feels amiss, something doesn't feel right, it's probably because it's not right. Please connect yourself with someone who is Epstein-Barr literate, just like anybody that does, for example, Lyme literate doctors who work primarily with that. It's really important that you don't just take a hush-hush approach that, oh, your symptom is not associated with this thing. It's really important that we keep continuing to talk about this stuff and educating each other around viral load and critters in general, whether that be bacteria, fungus, viruses. In this case, this was a virus we spoke about, but it's really an important thing to support ourselves because a lot of these unknown autoimmune conditions, why am I attacking myself? The body doesn't just attack itself for no reason. It doesn't just decide to wake up today and say, I'm going to create all this pro all these problems at the tissue level for this person. It's doing it because it's a, it's trying to figure out or trying to su support you and let you know there's a problem. We develop autoimmune conditions when there's problems. They don't just develop on their own. 
That's something really important to note. And so if you're dealing with anything across the board symptoms wise that hasn't been addressed from a root cause perspective, I really do invite you to get the appropriate testing. I do encourage you to connect with someone maybe like myself who does practice some more functional medicine things. We do a lot of things for the nervous system that can support your body to heal this stuff, a lot of things internally that can support you. I really just wanna encourage you that there are options out there because these things could be very debilitating and often get worse over time. The progression of any autoimmune condition, it gets worse over time. I hope that this video provided you guys some value and I really hope to see you in the Epstein Bar Group workshop. If you have any questions about it, please let me know, send me a message. Otherwise, I will see you guys all in the viral workshop where we're gonna talk a little bit more about the virus, but also support and uh, care for it. And how do we balance out some of the things that are happening symptoms wise. So thanks for tuning in. If you happen to like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe, turn the bell on so that you can stay tuned and stay connected with any videos and all of the content that we talk about here on this channel. Thanks guys, I'll see you in our next video.